Okay, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Denise Gigante of Stanford University, where she is the Sarah Durnham Patek Professor in the Humanities and the author of uh, many books, including uh, The Brothers Keats, The Life of uh, John and George, and the, uh, the very well-known Taste of Literary History, which if you haven't read it, I warmly recommend. But she's also the author of this book, Book Madness, which is a real landmark in uh, Elian studies. Uh, I warmly endorse it. It's a fabulous read. I read it in manuscript before it came out. And I think it's just uh, it's a masterpiece. It's a really great book. So over to you, Denise, and welcome to the Charles Lamb Society. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, the event turns out to be a little premature because the book uh, the, re the UK release date has been pushed back to January 10th, but I do have discount flyers from the press, so I'm going to send it around. Um, uh, this, yeah, I was originally, uh, I, I've decided not to tell the story of how Charles Lamb's library got to New York in 80, 1848. Um, that's in the book, and if you're interested uh, in seeing in detail, uh, how those books wound up there and what happened to them, um, you'll be able to do that in January. But in the meantime, what I wanted to do today was uh, talk about um, the, uh, what was fundamentally an American school of sentimental book collecting in the 19th century. And my focus, of course, was the mid 19th century when 60 uh, copies of Lamb's books, books from Lamb's library were sold in New York in 1848, causing great consternation uh, in Britain, but also um, much enthusiasm and even ecstasy in the United States. Um, I wanted to look at some of those books and then talk a little bit about how Lamb and his fellow essayists, Hunt and Hazlitt, were part of and um, a, a new school of bibliographical writing. Uh, compare that to the bibliographical writing of Thomas Frognall Dibden, the author of uh, uh, The Bibliomania. Um, and then talk a little bit about the so-called relics of Charles Lamb. So without further ado, let's see what time it is. Okay. So Charles Lamb uh, in the United States was revered uh, far over and above um, uh, his contemporary rep reputation in Britain. Um, he had fallen out of favor uh, in the mid uh, 19th century, whereas he was very beloved in the United States. And it's a fact that uh, it's an interesting <laughs> phenomenon that if you look at auction sale catalogs of the 19th century, if you do a survey, what you'll find is that any collection, any uh, important book collection that had copies of books from Charles Lamb's library in it, those books made the front page of the auction sale catalog. So no matter how expensive or how extensive the collection was, and most of these collections were uh, multi-day events uh, with books like the first editions of Hollinshead's Chronicles or one of Lamb's favorites, Isaac Walton's The Complete Angler. No matter what was in that collection, illuminated manuscripts, um, incunabula, Charles Lamb's books were front row center. And here you see uh, from this sale catalog, of November 1848, right in the middle, 18 volumes from the library of Charles Lamb in bold, right? That's the marquee event for this auction. Um, and yet, and it also had, uh, it also had uh, beautiful editions from the Roxburgh Club, from antiquarian societies, beautifully bound and produced books that just could not hold a candle to Lamb's old books, right? So this is Lamb's copy of uh, John Donne's poems, again, from the collection sold in New York in 1848. And you can see the typical shape of, that his books were in, 
Um, <laughs> the covers are detached, right? The leather is flaking. Even the title page has been pasted in from another copy of the book. Um, and it's mutilated and dirty. Uh, the binding you can see here uh, looks like it was in fact done by a cobbler from Enfield as, uh, as was uh, reputedly the case. Um, and the, 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 the pages are all foxed and so forth, but they're covered with Coleridge's marginalia. And to a sentimental collector, this is far more valuable than a gorgeous binding. You can see here the, um, on this page, GT Strong, GTS, sorry, George Templeton Strong's signature. He was very much working in the mode of STC uh, when he signed the title page of books from, from Charles Lamb's library, giving them his own proprietary value. Um, and this is, this is the back cover of another of Lamb's books, John Cleveland's poems. Um, and when he first saw them, uh, uh, the 19th century man of letters, Everett Augustus Doiking, probably the most crucial figure in the 1840s in the United States in terms of the making of an American literary canon, said to his brother, Lamb's library was a literary hospital for all stages of book decrepitude. Yet there was virtue in the least of those old books since as I actually heard a grosser remark on his first sight of them, Ilya has actually had this book in his hands. I've always wondered whether grosser here stands for tradesmen because New York by the mid uh, 19th century was the center of commerce in the United States. It was also the center of the book trade um, and the center of immigration and everything else by that point. What ended up happening uh, to those who were knowledgeable about books was that the, the, um, the old books would be comfortably housed in a beautifully bound leather box, right? And the sentimental value of them made it onto the spine along with the author and the date of publication and the title. So here we have done, uh, the, poem, the, the book collection is poems, 1669, but with notes by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Uh, when I gave a talk on this collection at the New York Public Library last week, um, we had the books from Lynn's collection lined up on cradles, and behind each one was one of these boxes that said, Charles Lamb's book, Charles Lamb's book, Charles Lamb's book. Um, so that's the main selling point of these particular association copies, as they were called. Uh, this is what uh, Coleridge's notes look like inside of the Dunn, a uh, copy of Dunn's poems. They were all over the place. Um, and they constituted uh, what I say in the book and believe was uh, the first attempt to theorize Dunn's metrics uh, in terms of a kind of subjective poetics. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a full-blown theory of poetics worked out in the margins of Lamb's copy of Dunn's poems. <laughs> The note here on the left at the bottom is one of STC's famous NBs. Uh, he had many postscripts following his postscripes often, but in this case, uh, Nota Bene, right? Though I, have, <clears throat> though I have written in it, this is and was uh, Mr. Charles Lamb's book, who I believe, uh, uh, who, sorry, who is likewise the possessor and I believe lawful, uh, proprietor of all the volumes of the old plays, excepting one. So this is a tongue in cheek wink to Charles Lamb because Coleridge had borrowed one of the volumes of his 12 volume collection of Dodsley's old plays and lost it. And this is the book that Lamb talks about in his essay, The Two Races of Men, in which he, uh, the two races are lenders and borrowers. He's in the weaker race right, the lenders, and Coleridge is among the borrowers. And he says to one like Yulia, whose treasures are rather cased in leather covers than in iron coffers, there is a class of alienators more formidable than that which I have touched upon. And so previously he was talking about borrowers of money. I mean borrowers of books, those mutilators of collections, spoilers of the symmetry of shelves and creators of odd volumes. Um, and in the same uh, uh, 
essay, he talks about the, the gaps that Coleridge left in his bookshelf, like huge eye teeth knocked, knocked out. He could hardly bear to see the devastation on his shelves. Um, Coleridge uh, also, beyond uh, doing things like um, working out uh, various theories and philosophies on various authors in Brown's books, um, would mark, as you see on the right, uh, his response to them. And this is a book in which he uh, writes a love letter to Sarah Hutchinson, uh, with whom he had just written the Ode to Dejection two years earlier, and he was still hopelessly in love with Sarah. And to guide her reading of Sir Thomas Brown, he included a key to his marginalia. So he says that uh, a dot represents a profound or at least solid and ju judicious observation. An equal sign is majesty of conception or style. Those, that's his uh, italics. A uh, double slash is sublimity, an X is brilliance or ingenuity, a Q is characteristic quaintness, and F is an error in fact or philosophy. Uh, if you go through typically Coleridge style, that's why I've pointed out the double exclamation point, it doesn't make it into his, uh, <laughs> into his key to his annotations, and one wonders whether he even followed it at all, but it's um, it's it's charming that the kind of marginalia that he, Lamb, and others left in books constituted its own um, its own network, right? Uh, this is the letter at the front of that book. This book is in the New York Public Library, and you can see that it's addressed to Sarah at midnight on a Saturday night. Um, Coler just sitting down and, you know, um, more or less writing a love letter to her, but it, it takes, it's a bibliographical love letter. It takes place through the writing, uh, writing about this book. And this is the quotation that begins this long letter. It's, it's hardly all of it. Sir Thomas Brown is among my first favorites, rich in various knowledge, exuberant in conceptions and conceits, contemplative, imaginative, often truly great and magnificent in his style and diction, though doubtless too often big, stiff, and hyper-Latinistic. Thus, I might, without admixture of falsehood, describe Sir T. Brown, and my description would have only this fault, that it would be equally or almost equally applicable to half a dozen other writers from the beginning of the reign of Elizabeth to the end of Charles II. He is indeed all this, and what he has more than all this peculiar to himself, I seem to convey to my own mind in some measure by saying that he is a quiet and sublime enthusiast with a strong tinge of the fantast, the humorist constantly mingling with and flashing across the philosopher as the darting colors in shot silk play upon the main dye. In short, he has brains in his head, which is all the more interesting for a little twist in the brains sometimes reminds the reader of Montaigne, but from no other reason than the general circumstances of an egotism common to both, which in Montaigne is often too often a mere amusing gossip, a chit chat story of whims and peculiarities that lead to nothing, but which in Sir Thomas Brown is always the result of a feeling heart conjoined with a mind of active curiosity, the natural and becoming egotism of a man who loving other men as himself gains the habit and the privilege of telling all about himself as familiarly as about other men. Um, and you, you, know, you can see here a theme that runs throughout Coleridge's marginalia, which is that philosophy is not true philosophy without the heart conjoined. And so Sir Thomas Brown, having both of these in, you know, in, in equal amounts, <laughs> Uh, it, what appealed very much to Coleridge and Lamb. Um, this is from the end of the book here. Um, Coleridge tells us on the back flyleaf, the difference between a great mind and a little mind, one of history. The latter would consider, for instance, what Luther did, taught, or sanctioned. The former, what Luther, a Luther, would now do, teach, and sanction. So 
Coleridge was not interested in history uh, in the way that Lamb was. He was interested in the philosophic necessity behind historical events. How can you abstract uh, something into a rule or a principle about human nature? And he says, if you would be well with a great mind, leave him with a favorable opinion of you. If with a little mind, leave him with a favorable opinion of himself. So these kinds of gems of wisdom are, are scattered through Lamb's books. Um, and this is what, this is another uh, comment, uh, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, by Elia. Reader, if haply thou art blessed with a moderate collection, be shy of showing it, or if thy heart overfloweth to lend them, lend thy books, but let it be to such a one as STC. He will return them generally anticipating the time appointed with usury, enriched with annotations, tripling their value. I have had experience. Many are these precious manuscripts of his, the matter oftentimes and almost in quantity, not unfrequently vying with the originals in no very clerkly hand. I counsel thee, shut not thy heart nor thy library against STC. And if this doesn't seem surprising to you, what is surprising is that at the time it was written, um, it was uh, uh, relatively prophetic because sentimental collecting um, and se the sentimental valuing of the book really had not come into its own. In fact, uh, it was, as I've suggested, making its appearance mainly across the Atlantic. But Lamb is already providing the basis for a certain type of collecting that was new in the 19th century. And he's giving us the groundwork, as I'll suggest in a minute, uh, to understand how, um, uh, how a sentimental economy can operate at the same time as in contrast to, and very often um, supersede a market economy. This was really important for Americans who were, who were spending most of their days in commerce and squeezing in letters and collecting and books around the margins of an otherwise uh, everyday life. So George Templeton Strong, who purchased the Dunn book, um, it recognizes also and starts to articulate this idea of sentimental collecting. Rarity, he says, adds to the value of what's good. So a rare book, collecting a rare book uh, as such would have been of interest to the Dibdinian school of collecting, which we'll talk about also. Um, but it alone is nothing. The technical bibliomania, the pure abstract delirium Dibdinianium, that rages after those things simply as book varieties, independently of any interest attaching to the edition, I never was smitten with to any great extent. He's giving voice in his diary in 1844, right, to what would become um, sort of codified uh, a century later, right? A, a very well-established tradition of sentimental collecting. When I showed this book, <laughs> Uh, this is still the Dunn book to uh, the library to a, to a room full of librarians at the New York Public Library. They all went <gasps> seeing the book plate pasted in like that to the book. Um, what is above it is a comment by George Templeton Strong, uh, who we just heard from, in his handwriting, saying that Coleridge's annotations on this copy of Lim's copy of Dunn. Um, have been printed in an edition of Coleridge's Marginalia by Derwent Coleridge, and that they were uh, in that in a note to, to those notes uh, said to have been communicated uh, by George T. Strong of New York. And so you see in the bracket there at the bottom, he says, I certainly never communicated them directly or indirectly and cannot guess how they got there. So, uh, you know, I think that this speaks to another theme of my book, which is that this network, the sentimental network that arose around Lamb's books, uh, often got detached from the books themselves. So it was probably Doikink himself who copied, he didn't buy any of Lamb's books because he thought they were overpriced and that would be not in the spirit of Ilya. He went to the store with his notebook and copied out the marginalia in his own copies of the books. Um, 
it's most likely that they got to Derwent Coleridge through Doi Kink, but that's my own speculation. Um, and here you'll see the difference between uh, two different kinds of collectors in the 19th century. So you have on the left, um, uh, a millionaire from New York, a yachtsman, who uh, rebound Lamb's copy of John Cleveland's poems uh, in the manner we've seen on book boxes, Cleveland's poems, right? Author title date, 1662, and right in the middle, Charles Lamb's copy. If you look across the screen, you'll see the second copy of Cleveland's poems that was in the collection sold in 1848, uh, purchased by a different collector who knew better than to rebind the book, right? This book would not be the same if it came in new clothing. And um, this collector, William Thomas Hildreth Ho of Cincinnati, who obtained the book, knew that, right? So he pasted his prestigious gilt book plate into the inside copy of the book, leaving the rest of it to speak in its own terms. And that's, that's what a true sentimental bibliomaniac would have done. Um, uh, knowing that the value of the book is as what in the trade was known as an association copy. So this is um, a sentimental library, uh, which was Harry B. Smith's um, own annotated bibliography of his own collection, his own sentimental collection. And you'll see how he subtitles it, comprising books formerly owned by famous writers, presentation copies, manuscripts, and drawings. By 1914, collecting uh, recent, uh, recent being, you know, uh, Shakespeare or after, um, editions of English literary history was its own field of collecting. It was a new field of collecting. If you have questions about this, you can let me know after. But, uh, but Lamb's books had all sorts of other kinds of indications in them of former use. So here you have a copy of Cleveland's poems with uh, part of an elegy carefully clipped out, probably pasted somewhere into a scrapbook. Here you have it at the bottom of, um, you have the salutation, not salutation, valediction or what have you. Um, clipped out, for what reason? You know, it's anybody's guess. Uh, Lamb left very frequently in the copy of his books, um, cross references to other books in his library. So here you have, uh, uh, you know, see, I think this is Godwin London poem, um, but, but this happens all the time for Lamb. You know, make sure you read this biography of this author or see this poem which relates to this. Uh, that was a technique Lamb used in his marginalia. Um, you see things like tobacco holes or whatever that is on the left, uh, you know, spillings in the books, all sorts of, you know, these books were around the home. And then corrections. Lamb was very scrupulous about correcting printer's errors and any other error that he would notice, and he had a hawk eye for noticing them. Um, he also would correct footnotes. So if there was a footnote that was vague or imprecise, he would correct it. He's very scholarly in that sense in his annotations. Uh, he also, um, like Coleridge, pointed to passages that he found moving or significant. And Along with his category of corrections were um, it, it, larger corrections, as in this case, where um, we're, ex we're, we're told to expect a quotation from Cicero, but then the next page of the book goes on and, and the printer forgot to put in the Cicero quotation. So Lamb writes, insert, this is in the back flyleaf, insert bottom of page 60, and he gives us the quotation that should be there. This is in the back of the other copy of Cleveland. Uh, it's, uh, it's a poem, uh, what's, what's a protector, the definition of a protector. And it's, Lamb uh, intends it to go across from another Cleveland reference to Cromwell. Um, here you see uh, the protector is a stately thing that apes it in the nonage of a king a tragic actor, Caesar in a clown. He's a brass farthing stamped with a 
Brown. So, you know, Cle uh, Cleveland was not uh, Republican by any means. And uh, Lamb adds his own footnote to the poem. You'll see at the bottom saying that Cromwell was supposed to, uh, his family was supposed to have been brewer, a brewer, brewers. His father was a brewer, which is why um, Cleveland <coughs> as uh, having, let's see, where is it? An echo, where's the brewer? Where's the footnote? Oh, uh, four lines from the bottom, a uh, fantastical image of the royal, uh, of the royal heart, the brewers with the king's arms. Um, so, all right. So now that we've seen some images of the books, I want to suggest why Lamb can be considered as being at the head, not just of a new school of uh, sentimental collecting, but also of bibliographical writing. Uh, that comes into its own, particularly through Lamb and his fellow essayists. So in the, in the, besides the piece that Judith read from Old China, um, you know, the essays that Lamb devotes to his books were very, very well known in, in the United States, and they were models for collectors. Hazlitt's essay on reading old books is incomparable, um, and Lee Hunt had tons of essays, of course, on books. Um, a lot of them collected in under the title Men in Books. And one thing that Hunt recognizes is the associational value of, of a book as, as, as being behind, again, sentimental attachment. If there be one word in our language, he says, beyond all others teeming with delightful associations, books is that word. And we get more of this in Hazlitt's essay on reading old books. He says, not only, he says, when I read an old book, are the old ideas of the contents of the work brought back to my mind in all their vividness, but the old associations of the faces and persons of those I then knew as they were in their lifetime. The place where I sat to read the volume, the day when I got it, the feeling of the air, the fields, the sky, return and all my early impressions with them. This is better to me, those places, those times, those persons, and those feelings that come across me as I retrace the story and devour the page are to me better far than the wet sheets of the last new novels. I not only have the pleasure of imagination and of a critical relish of the work, but the pleasures of memory added to it. It recalls the same feelings and associations which I had in first reading it and which I can never have again in any other way. Standard productions of this kind are links in the chain of our conscious being, they bind together the different scattered divisions of our personal identity. They are landmarks and guides in our journey through life. They are pegs and loops on which we can hang up or from which we can take down at pleasure the wardrobe of a moral imagination. And you can hear his reference to Burke in here. But what you can also hear is um, the origins of a certain kind of bibliographical buildings from on which I, I would say we also find in Coleridge's Biographia Literaria, in Thomas Frognall Dibden's Reminiscences of a Literary Life, uh, building one's way through, building one's identity through one's reading is a particularly romantic way of thinking about subjectivity, uh, particularly, particularly in the essayists. Um, the essay Detached Thoughts on Books and Reading uh, gave guidelines for American collectors, right? On thinking about collecting. Um, so for Lamb to be strong-backed and neat bound is the desideratum of a volume. Magnificence comes after. This, he says, when it can be afforded is not to be lavished upon all kinds of books indiscriminately. I would not dress a set of magazines, for instance, in full suit. The dishabille or half-binding Russia backs ever is our costume. And so the, um, the disabil he's speaking about is uh, a volume that's not completely dressed in leather, but has it where it needs it to protect the book. So the spine and the corners that get the most square are covered um, with, with leather, whereas the rest are marbled boards that give a kind of decoration to the book, but do nothing structurally to contain it. Um, you know, when I was looking at one of Lamb's old books in the 
Harvard, uh, the Houghton Library, I had to bring back the cradle because I had a foam cradle, right, that the book was on. And it was in such bad shape that all of the leather was coming off onto the cradle. So I had to get a glass one that wouldn't, you know, continue to have that effect on the book. Uh, you're probably all familiar with Lamb's thoughts about Shakespeare, that owning a special edition of Shakespeare, like a first folio, right, which is for bardomaniacs, as I call them, uh, the sort of holy grail of Shakespeare collecting. Uh, no, Lamb finds that to, you know, he says, I have a community of feeling with my countrymen about his plays, and I like those editions of him best, which have been often, often is tumbled about and handled. Um, so I do not care for a first folio of Shakespeare. Um, however, uh, he also goes on about Shakespeare to say that he preferred, we all know his Shakespeare criticism and the idea that Shakespeare is far superior in the imagination uh, to his concrete manifestations on stage. And so too with the illustrations, he prefers the rough woodcuts of the Rowan Thompson of Everyman edition of the 18th century, like today's signet paperbacks or what have you, uh, because they were so wretchedly bad, he thought, that it, they forced your imagination in remembering the play to build the image. Whereas the Boydell Shakespeare edition, which had these gorgeously polished engravings from the Boydell Shakespeare gallery, were distasteful to him because they were all said and done and there was nothing really his imagination could add to them. On the contrary, he says, I cannot read Bowman and Fletcher, but in folio. And then this is the last thing I'll point out about Lamb's uh, 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 instructions on book collecting. There are many more, but that there are some books which are not books, right? They're dressed up to look like books, but he doesn't count them as books. In this catalog, he says, of books which are no books, Biblia a Biblia, which gets a big laugh in the US. Um, I reckon court calendars, directories, pocketbooks, draft boards, bound and leathered at the back, scientific treatises, almanacs, statutes at large, the works of Hume, Gibbon, Robertson, Beatty, Soane, James, and generally all those volumes which, quote, no gentleman's library should be without. I confess that it moves my spleen to see these things in books clothing perched upon shelves like false saints, usurpers of true shrines, intruders into the sanctuary, <clears throat> thrusting out the legitimate occupants. This idea of books that are no books, right? Uh, things that might look good on one's shelves and that one might purchase as one might attempt to purchase cultural capital. These aren't really books is taken up by Doykink in his very, very influential uh, library of choice reading as the motto for the collection. Books which are books, right? Um, here and in that, in that library, kind of like the forerunner to today's Library of America are um, works by Lamb, by Hazlitt, by Hunt, uh, etc. And uh, it was published by Wiley and Putnam in New York in the 1840s. It was probably the most influential um, series uh, published in America uh, in the antebellum period. And again, Charles Lamb heads the, heads, you know, guides, guides this idea of choice in collecting or selecting if you're an editor. Uh, and now it's useful to think about this kind of bibliographical writing that you see in the essayists you're familiar with, with the bibliographical writing of Thomas Frognall Dibden, who was the popularizer of the idea of book madness, um, who was contemporaneous with Lamb, and who branched out of technical bibliographical writing. Keep in mind that up through the 18th century, bibliography meant the description of books. It usually meant uh, author, title, size of the book, uh, number of volumes. And then an annotated bibliography would have some details about woodcuts. That was it. This, in, in the hands of Thomas Frognall, Dibden bibliography becomes much more creative. Um, so you have um, the three different editions of Bibliomania that we're talking about, we'll talk about in a moment, take different forms. 
He began bibliography, a poem in 1812 as an epic. Uh, he only published the first book of it. Um, the bibliographical Decameron takes the form of a dialogue, right? Philosophical dialogue. Um, he has bibliographical antiquarian and picturesque tours on the continent and also in, in Northern Britain. Um, he has a kind of conduct manual for libraries, uh, library companion or the young man's guide and the old man's comfort in the choice of the library. What I would call his bibliographical autobiography, reminiscences of a literary life and so forth. This was a way that we can fit bibliography into the sort of formal inventiveness of romanticism as, as creating these hybrid forms. This slide is out of place. Um, I would say that the tradition of bibliography as a, a literary genre, actually, we get a glimpse of it in the mid 14th century with the Philobiblon by, by Richard de Bury, who was a medieval bibliomaniac. And he produced 20 essays uh, about books and collecting. And what they miss that we get taken up, not again until the Romantic period, is the subjective element. So when de Bury uh, talks about books, he's talking about them objectively, what's valuable about them, how to treat them, and so forth and so on. Personal empirical experience doesn't really enter so much. We don't get a sense of the essayist mixing in with books. We get a sense of essays about books. So more strictly bibliographical. Okay, now uh, the three copies of, uh, sorry, the three editions of Bibliomania that became a kind of bestseller at the time were, uh, were these. The first one was 1809. Uh, it took the form of a mock medical treatise, the Bibliomania or book madness, right? In Gothic, red Gothic type containing some account of the history, symptoms, and cure of this fatal disease. Uh, it took the form of a verse epistle to, sorry, it wasn't verse, took the form of an epistle to Richard Heber, who was the biggest bibliomaniac of all time, the fiercest and strongest, Thomas Campbell called him. Um, and rather than then earlier uh, uh, bibliomaniacs who would say fill their house so full of books that they had to sleep in the corridor, Heber filled nine houses with books. So his ancestral home at Podnet Hall was stuffed with books. Two homes in London were full of books with bookshelves three rows thick. Um, and then he had houses uh, on the continent where he would go on his book buying jaunts. Um, and they were all full of books as well. So Heber had, by the end, collected a library that was bigger than most university libraries in Europe, um, that rivaled state libraries, was bigger than the university, uh, sorry, um, the Dublin library, et cetera. And when Dibden, who knew Heber personally, uh, went to his home in Pimlico after his death, he had never been Heber kept him out. He had never been there before. Dibden couldn't believe his eyes. Even Dibden couldn't believe his eyes. He said, I had never seen rooms, cupboards, passages, and corridors so choked, so suffocated with books. Trouble rows were here, double rows were there. Hundreds of slim quartos, several upon each other, were longitudinally placed over thin and stunted duodecimos, reaching up from one extremity of a shelf to another, up to the very ceiling, the piles of volumes extended, while the floor was strewn with them in loose and numerous heaps. Um, so this, this is something you see satirized, say, in Walter Scott's The Antiquary. Uh, you get a picture of this kind of collector. But again, nine houses were like this. Heber is known for this quotation, that saying that a true book collector never owns under three copies of any individual book. He says, why you see, <clears throat> no man can comfortably do without three copies of the book. One he must have for his show copy, another he will require for his own use and reference. And unless he is inclined to part with this, which is very inconvenient or risk the injury of his best copy, he must needs have a third at the service of his friends. And the reason I have an image of the Lennox Library here is that James Lennox was the American equivalent of Heber. 
He was the bibliomaniac par excellence of the 19th century and his library was ultimately incorporated with the Astor Library in 1895 to form the New York Public Library, which is now uh, among the two or three top uh, public libraries in the world. Um, but Heber, uh, sorry, Lennox's collection, you know, Lennox said the same thing. He needed three copies of the book, right? He would have one stored away somewhere. Uh, he would have one for his own use. And then rather than searching for either of those, he would buy a copy if his friends needed to see a uh, you know, the book. He was very careful never to lend them out. If you wanted to use his books, you needed to make an appointment with his butler uh, and use them under supervision. But Lennox never made himself um, visible to, to these people. He was, a, he was a recluse. And really the only person who got to know him was his bookseller. Uh, Henry Stevens. The other aspect that's interesting about uh, Dibden's first edition of Bibliomania is the book fool who appears on the title page with his brush there, uh, keeping his books clean. Um, and it's taken, it's a detail taken from uh, Albrecht Durer's image of the book fool uh, from the 16th century. And, you know, Dibden does hear what he's accused of doing elsewhere, which is to take these images out of context. So a strict, say, woodcutter wouldn't be happy with that, wood engraver. Uh, and yet what he does do is use the genre of bibliography creatively, right? He's focused here on the book Fool and his book. The book Fool was... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the book fool was a, a well-known figure and it's, it's what is, lies behind the paper size fool's cap, which is basically a, a folio size paper. Why? Because the watermark of the first paper makers or the first paper maker who invented the fool's cap size uh, was the book fool. So this is the book fool, the watermark, two versions of the watermark of the book fool. Um, the book fool was one of only many different kinds of fools that made up the ship of state, right? A, a very, an age old metaphor, right? Running the boat, running the ship of state, the bunch of fools. Um, and so this book uh, in its original German was um, by Sebastian Brandt, 1494, translated immediately, immediately into Latin and then in 1509, translated by Alexander Barclay into English. This is significant because, hmm, because, because you'll see that the attribution on the title page of Dibden's book, uh, Bibliomania, is Hinson's Ship of Fools. It's not the author, it's not the translator, it's the printer. And it's a specific edition. This is a kind of, this is another in-joke, right? Dibden is saying, look, uh, if you understand this book, you'll understand that it's very important which edition I'm talking about. And the, the, the caption from the book full is, still I am busy books assembling for to have plenty. It is a pleasant thing in my conceit. And to the, have them eye in hand, but what they mean, I do not understand. This is the basis for Joseph Addison's Tom Folio, uh, a caricature that appeared in the Tatler of the pedant, the bibliographer who knew nothing about literary value, but everything about bibliographical value, typography, paper quality, binding, et cetera. And Pinson is, uh, you may know the printer, uh, one of the earliest English printers and the, and the one who gave us Roman type. So italic type comes from the Aldean press and then black letter was what was more typically in use in early printed books. The second edition changes to a bibliographical romance. It's no longer a treatise on a fatal disease um, and the image changes, no longer a book fool, but a very cultured gentleman in the Bodleian library surrounded by valuable books. That's the 1811 
by 1842, this is the last edition, the book had expanded still more, um, and there are no books at all on the title page. Um, the, and the books that are there on another page have been polished up, right, from the original woodcut in 1811. He keeps, however, the black and red um, uh, uh, type that was used in early printed books, and he keeps the Gothic type in Book Madness. This is where we can, this is where we get the delirium dibdinianum <laughs> that we <laughs> looked at earlier by George Templeton Strong. This is the passion for early printed books, incunabula, rare books, variants, etc., without necessarily any personal interest attached to them. It doesn't matter who had owned them or what they had been through. By 1832, um, the uh, Heber died in 1833. His library was dispersed at auction. Um, it, the book market was flooded in the 1830s were a very bad time in Britain for the book trade. So in 1832, we get Dibden publishing Bibliophobia or remarks on the present languid and depressed state of literature in the book trade in a letter, not to the book collector, but to himself, the author of the Bibliomania. All right, this is my second to last slide. Uh, at this moment, as I show in the book, in the 1830s, uh, the bibliomania sort of swept across the ocean, and it was the Americans who really came into it with, with all the money. Um, and uh, so we have George Templeton Strong again in 1839. New York is certainly infected with the bibliomania. I never saw anything like the eagerness to buy and the prices given. And the last note that I wanted to leave us with is the idea that an association copy, when it came to somebody like Charles Lamb, who was, after all, St. Charles for book collectors, he was the patron saint of book collectors, um, there arose the category of the spurious association copy, right? Um, just as relics of Shakespeare's famous mulberry tree had been uh, sort of fabricated. You know, here's here's a block of mulberry wood, but you know, is it really from Shakespeare's tree? Um, same thing with the relics of Charles Lamb. So we have Richard Charles Jackson, who prints a book plate uh, that claim that somewhere between 100 and 200 copies of books that he owned had formerly belonged to Charles Lamb. So we have relics of Charles Lamb purchased at Edward Moxon's sale. Moxon did not have a sale. Uh, by Francis Jackson, Esquire, citizen, merchant, and ship owner of London. This is presumably the Captain Jackson of the Elia Essays. Um, offices, Rude Lane, admitted freeman of the Pavoir City Company, 14th March, 1805. There was no matching name on the archive records of the city of London. Red House, et cetera. So this is a purely inventive, you know, almost in Dibdinian spirit, um, association copy. <laughs> it's connected to Charles Lamb through uh, Richard Charles Jackson, who claimed that his middle name, Charles, was uh, a derivation of what was given to him. He was named after Charles Lamb. And he says that he's descended from Lamb's Captain Jackson, claimed that it was his grandfather. And this was pure inventiveness. Um, Jackson had collected about 8,000 books at his home in London. Uh, and he had a separate Lamb room. So in that room were not just all of these books with Lamb's book plate. And by the way, some of those books uh, you know, Jackson would go so far as to say, write his own marginalia. Oh, I could see why Lamb would have appreciated this. You know, he's making it up. Um, there were also, you know, uh, Lamb's uh, card table, the Lamb's card table, or their tea set, or it was full of relics, but in a really interesting way that the relic industry usually attributes to Shakespeare. Uh, these are all relics of Charles Lamb, right? So you can see how, again, connected he was to, to, to and beloved by bibliomaniacs. So I guess I'll end there. And I'm happy to 
answer any questions or what have you. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, I think what we'll do is just...